Okay, I show that it is 4 p.m. Eastern, so uh, it's top of the hour. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is Carla McAuliffe. I am the Executive Director for the National Earth Science Teachers Association, and I'd like to welcome you to join us in this webinar. Um, this is part of a larger series, Implementing the Next Generation Science Standards in Earth Science. We've been doing this series for about five years, and we're very excited for today's series, which came um, while thinking about the theme for Earth Science Week, which is next week. And the theme for Earth Science Week is Gene Science is for Everyone. So today we're going to talk about operationalizing that theme. Uh, and we have some exciting panelists. Um, once again, would you please make sure that if you haven't, well, you should already be muted, but please don't unmute or start your video. Uh, locate the chat box and the participant box, and we should be ready to go. Uh, next slide, Andrew. Uh, so again, this is uh, the title of our uh, webinar, and we just want to let you know this webinar is being recorded. We do that so that we can archive them and allow teachers to come back and access them over and over. Uh, the organizers for this webinar are Aida Wad, and she's the past president of NAGT, plus has served as secretary and treasurer. Uh, Ed Robeck with the American Geosciences Institute, uh, myself, and Andrew, who will be assisting us from CERC and NAGT. Um, so at this point, um, I'm just going to briefly introduce Chris, Billy, and Erica, our three speakers, and then I'll let them briefly say something about themselves as they start each of their sections. Uh, so we have Chris Atchison from the International Association for Geoscience Diversity, IAGD, at the University of Cincinnati main campus. Uh, we're fortunate to have Billy Williams from the American Geophysical Union uh, from He's the Vice President for AGU Ethics, Diversity, and Inclusion. And we also have Erica Marin Spiota from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So uh, what we intend to do is to have the three panelists speak from around 10 to 12 minutes, and they have a few poll questions and interactive features, and then we'll have some time for some discussion and question and answer at the end. If you do have questions, you can also put them in the chat box, and if there's time during a speaker's presentation, they may address them then, or we may come back and address them at the end. We'll also be having a post-webinar survey at the end of the webinar. Okay, uh, and I already said that. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, operationalizing the Earth Science Week theme. And Chris is up first. Thank you, Carla. Hey, everybody. Chris Atchison, um, former middle school science teacher, uh, now researching uh, inclusivity and access with respect to geoscience education. Um, also in the School of Education at the University of Cincinnati and working with our science education majors, specifically in middle grades education. So I cover um, kind of the spectrum between uh, middle school and high school into post-secondary. Um, and in everything that I do in my science methods courses and the classes, I, in my geoscience classes and the field-based courses that I teach, I really focus in on this idea of inclusion, especially using universal design for learning. Um, is one of the big things that I expect my students to be able to do and to know. And so I know that um, a lot of the folks that are on this webinar now come from uh, across K-12 into post-secondary and informal education. So I'm gonna give you some ways that I've worked to support students with disabilities, not only in, in science, but in, uh, in the geosciences and field-based learning as well. So um, what I would encourage you to do uh, if you have questions, throw them into the chat window um, and we can get to those. If we can't get them to them right during the call, I'll be happy to uh, respond to you after the fact as well. So uh, Andrew, next slide. So this was a, uh, uh, a quote that came from Robin Bell last year at AGU and AGU was in uh, Washington DC in her opening address. Um, she really hit the nail on the head here when we're talking about science Science, we do better science when everyone's at the table, not just the common scientist, but understanding that, that a lot of science has a very exclusive culture that we're trying to address 
And the more diversity we have at the table, the stronger and more innovative the science becomes. Andrew? And so some of you may uh, be aware of, of the organization, the International Association for Geoscience Diversity. This was an organization that we started back in 2008 as really a network for instructors to share resources and share information about how to best support students with disabilities in their classes. Um, at the time, there were a lot of great people doing great work to support their students instructionally, but then when that student would move away from their introductory class or any class that they were teaching, those resources would rarely get used again um, and really never to be shared or seen. So this was just a network. We created a network to get people to start sharing those resources and seeking resources and assistance. This organization is now um, in its 11th year, we're finishing up our 11th year where we have a network now that, ex that spans to over 40 countries around the world. And our very first chapter was started um, and sponsored by the Geological Society of London in 2018 called DIG UK. And so DIG, DIG UK is really focused not only on disability, but their focus on diversity broadly. Andrew? So I would ask you, um, to consider how representative you think the geosciences are according to the spectrum of ability in the US population. So we have a US population, that population has uh, a certain number of people with disabilities who identify as having a disability. How do you think earth science specifically fares according to the total US population of people with disabilities? I would ask you to consider that. Andrew? And so when we think about ability, I would like you to consider ability on a continuum. Um, and, and, and by doing so, we realize that disability is not a deficit. We all fall on this continuum at some place. We all, um, from seeing to hearing, learning, walking, reading, writing with a pen or a pencil, being able to communicate verbally, tune out distractions, manage mental and physical health, we all are on this spectrum. We're all on this continuum. And so we need to think about this from a fact that disability is not a deficit, but rather the environment that we try to, that, that we all try to integrate into is what is completely inaccessible oftentimes. The exclusion is a social construct, just like the word normal. Do we really know what normal means? And so when we consider ability, I want you to think about how we all fall on this ability continuum. Andrew? So going back to the statistics that I was just talking about, according to the U.S. Census, about one out of every five Americans have a disability of some kind. Um, and more than one in three American households survey at least had one member who identified as having a disability. Globally, about 15% of the world's population has a disability of some kind. This is the largest underrepresented group. Disability transcends across all of diversity and yet oftentimes um, receives the fewest or the littlest acknowledgement of it being um, an underrepresented group or population that needs to be addressed in, in all the work that we do. Andrew? So what does it mean to be inclusive? Again, I would ask you to consider this. Um, what does inclusion look like? What does it take to be inclusive? If it's in our K-12 classrooms, uh, post-secondary classrooms, community colleges, four-year universities, in our museum centers, informal education, what does it truly mean to be inclusive? Andrew? To be inclusive, we need to consider that everyone is able to be included, obviously, but to be involved in an activity or anything that you are planning to do. This isn't just at the moment, but also planning to be involved. How do you, if you have a student that has a specific disability type, planning to get them involved is, is inclusion. 
how does everyone able to collaborate, to communicate? How does everyone advocate? And so on a lot of my uh, accessible field trips, I often tell everyone to advocate for each other. So a lot of times uh, students are, um, they may be struggling with something, uh, anxiety might be setting in and unable to really advocate, truly advocate for something that they need. And so I put the ownership back on uh, their peers, their partners, their collaborators to help advocate for them as well. Inclusion means how do we all overcome barriers? We all stay open-minded and we learn from everyone. The, the, over the past 11, 12 years that I've been doing this work, everything that I've learned, honestly, has come from the students that I've been working with. And so being open-minded and learning from others, realizing that you're not the expert when it comes to something that's very different than you, uh, goes a long way. And realizing that everyone we're working with impacts the entire community of learning. So trying to be inclusive, working towards inclusion, supports everyone, not just the few. Andrew. So in the chat window, I would like you all to consider this. What barriers do your students face currently? Whether you're uh, in a, a middle school classroom, a high school classroom, whether you do outreach informally, whether you're in community college for your youths, for your institutions. What barriers do your students face in your classrooms or in your field sites or in your laboratories? So take a minute as we continue here and put something in the chat window that identifies the barriers that your students are currently facing. Andrew? And so, interestingly enough, this, was a, this is a great quote, and I actually borrowed this quote from Cheryl Bergstahler at the University of Washington. This really kind of reflects back to the deficit model and how society, in society we really focus on blame. We try to place blame. When you plant, well, this should say plants, not plan. When you plant lettuce, if it doesn't grow, do you blame the lettuce? No, you look for reasons it's not doing well. Environmentally, you look for reasons. Maybe it needs more water. Maybe it needs less water. Maybe it needs more or less sun. Maybe the soil isn't, isn't, isn't good soil. So think about this. Think about this from the perspective of your students. If your students are not doing well, are you gonna blame the student? Or are you going to blame the environment? Are you going to look for reasons in the environment that the student that is that is causing the student to struggle? A lot of times there's a lot of, most of the time there's a lot of outside influences that are impacting the student as well. Do we truly get to know what those outside influences are and work to address them? Andrew? So this is a this is a big one too, and when we're working in the, the the disability community, a lot of times I see faculty who mean very very well, and they want to do the best that they can to support their students. And my first question to them is always, "Have you spoken to the student about this?" And most always, it's no, I haven't. And so why are we trying to make decisions for our students without actually including them in the decision-making process? If we want to improve the environment for them, they are the experts in what they can and cannot do. And oftentimes you'll, it, they will surprise you in the fact that they can do more than you realize that they can do physically, intellectually, emotionally, academically. And so we need to make sure that we step away from our own stereotypes and our own biases and learn, communicate with, give the students a voice and learn from them and, and be collaborative in your planning to support them. 
And when I talk about this from field-based learning, and I'll show you some pictures of, of examples of, of ways that we've done this, realize that oftentimes full participation or inclusion into the learning community does not always have to mean that it's 100% physically accessible. Inclusive communities of learning are just that. They are very social, they are very supportive, they are very deliberate. Let me give you a few examples of how we've done this. Andrew? Chris, you're at 13 minutes, just to let you know. So this is a picture of a trip that we took in Vancouver. It's hard to see down on the actual floodplain that there are students down there, that the students in the foreground just are not physically able to get down to, to view that. So we purposefully selected this field site that the students are able to be engaged in the learning from their vantage point. But the most important piece here is the social learning. Andrew, next slide. That when we discussed the science and everybody brought the science back, we did it all as a group. Did it all as a group. So the learning, the true learning here came as a result of this group work. Andrew, next slide. This is another instance that uh, the volcano, this volcano in Flagstaff, Arizona, SP Crater, very inaccessible for a lot of us. Andrew, next slide. Here are students at the top. We purposefully integrated technology uh, to be able to communicate and include folks who could not get to the top. Next slide. This was one of the views that we were up there to kind of get a, a better perspective of. Obviously not everyone could get up there. We used cell phone technology with the iPads. Next slide, Andrew to be able to relay this back to the students who were in the vans or who were at the base camp down there. Go ahead, Andrew. Here's another vantage point, a trip that we took uh, in Ireland. Students, uh, faculty on this trip had very different vantage points. If you see them down by the water, there are students along the water uh, that, that are in sites that are physically inaccessible. Next slide. We purposefully selected sites that everyone could get up uh, to actually see this. Next slide, Andrew. Another perspective of that. Next slide. Just a couple more shots of students working collaboratively. Keep going. Giving them an opportunity to work together to do the science. Uh, one more shot there. All right, so what's the research telling us? Next slide. The traditional methods often marginalize those who do not fit the culturally normalized identity. What does that really mean? What is a culturally normalized identity? The issue of inaccessibility and exclusion is much larger and more widespread than we realize. There's a lot of students, especially in post-secondary, who are purposefully not disclosing a disability and that the laws and safeguards to protect these, uh, the identity potentially redirect bias and stereotype. We see this in the classrooms where faculty just truly don't believe students oftentimes that they have a disability. Realizing that most disabilities are non-apparent and that inclusively designed opportunities supports all students. Uh, next couple slides, we'll go through these really quickly so we can move on. This is just data. Go ahead, Andrew. Data that uh, we're seeing from Fortune 500 companies that are focused on access and inclusion are doing much, much better. Why is diversity vital for innovation? These are a couple of, uh, of quick um, reads to, to talk about that. Geoscience careers, next slide. There's a lot of them, a lot of diversity in geoscience careers in general. Not all of them require you to be physically fit to climb the top of a mountain. Um, and then I think we'll skip a couple of them here. So we'll skip that one. Here's some resources that you're welcome to use. Everyone is, uh, so I do want to make sure that I do mention this, the Inclusive Geoscience Education and Research Award, the IAGD gives out an IGER award 
that supports anyone doing it, anyone working to promote access and inclusion uh, from K-12 to post-secondary to informal education. This is a research, this is a research and an education award. Um, for more information, check out the link there, the IG.org forward slash forward slash Iger. And that is all I have. Thank you, Chris. And we'll uh, hold questions until the end so we can get through our panelists. Okay, Carly, you ready for me? Yes, we are. Okay, so hello everybody. My name is Billy Williams. I serve as uh, Vice President for Ethics, Diversity and Inclusion at AGU. And before we get started, I will just make the, the disclaimer that uh, I, AGU does not do a lot of work in, in K-12. Most of our activities in K-12 arena are related to supporting programs like those in, in, in NESTA or NAGT. Uh, other organizations, and we partner with AGI uh, for their work in this arena. So we don't lead in that area, but some of the things I will talk to you about today are things that we're doing that we think help set the stage for our earth, earth and spray science environment overall to make sure that the geoscience is seen as being for, for everybody. And I hope some of the things, a few of the things I will share with you today can help give you a picture for what some of those other resources and activities might be that, that can influence this work. Uh, next slide. So let me just start by telling you a little bit about our demographics within AGU. Uh, this probably is not new information for many of you, but AGU is a membership organization of about 60,000 members. And within that membership, uh, the percentage of, of women scientists is somewhere between 27 and 29 percent currently. Uh, the percentage of uh, folks, uh, members residing outside the United States is a little over 40%, uh, but we are growing more and more international uh, by the year in that currently over 50% of our first authors in our AGU publications are from outside the United States. Many people ask us about ethnic and racial diversity in AGU, and we collect these data within the U.S., and currently in the U.S., uh, we, have, we don't have uh, extensive data. Um, it's, it shows around four to five percent uh, racial and ethnic minority underrepresented group participation uh, in the geosciences. And there are some more exact data available through AGI and pull from uh, uh, you know, National Science Foundation. Uh, next slide just shows a little bit about our age distribution. Average age is about 45 years of age. I think our age, is, our age average age is, is fairly steady. Uh, but the percentage of uh, women scientists is growing, the percentage of uh, uh, members outside the United States is certainly growing, and, but the percentage of underrepresented, what we call underrepresented populations, ethnic minorities and others in the United States, uh, is, has not grown over the past, I would say, 20 to 30 years, and we're uh, paying a lot of attention to that, and I think the place where this will start would be in the K-12 arena, um, but that's not where AGU is focusing its work, so I think there's a, an opportunity here for us to partner more strongly with those groups who are uh, focused in that area uh, to provide uh, the, the needed support to make sure we have a health, healthy pipeline. So the next slide, I use this next slide as a photo to show uh, what I consider to be our work. Our work here is it was what I call, the reason I want to get up every morning is not to go work on uh, ethics or diversity or inclusion per se, but it's really how do we provide the best climate for everyone and what I call building the irresistible organization. So this photo here is from the 2018 AGU fall meeting. This is showing everyone just waiting around for the uh, exhibit hall to open on Monday night. And as you can see, it must, we must be doing something well in that exhibit hall and be, because people are just waiting to get in. And so I use this as a metaphor for what we want to build for the geosciences as, as a whole and also for AGU specifically that we build this community where it's so attractive, people are just waiting at the door trying to get in, and I think that waiting would start at K through 12. Uh, next slide. So there's a lot of work we need to do to make sure there's awareness there. There's some work that we're doing, and my work uh, specifically is supporting diversity, ethics, and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion within AGU. But that work has underpinnings or cuts across several programmatic efforts at AGU, the talent pool programming, 
the diversity inclusion programming, the Ethics and Equity Center program, and I'll talk a little bit about these. Uh, but the one in the middle I do want to highlight because that is the strategic underpinning, underpinning for what we are doing and how this might translate into some additional efforts as we extend a look at what's happening in K-12. Uh, so on talent pool, I'll, I'll talk about each one of these, um, but in diversity and inclusion, the strategic plan has a bold statement. It calls for AGU to be a model organization or, or the model organization in, in Earth and Space Sciences for diversity and inclusive practices. And so uh, there's, a, there's a lot more we can and should be doing in that arena. We have a very, very strong uh, DNI advisory committee looking across our programs, giving advice on things we can and should be doing. Um, so uh, in the chat box, if there are things you would say, well, if you're going to be a model organization in DNI, um, here are some things, here are some suggestions we would have for you that are things you're either missing the boat or things you're doing well, we want to continue. Awesome opportunities to go forward. Uh, next slide. So just going back to the underpinnings I showed earlier, this is a slide that was sourced from Pernodi Asher, just showing the things that we do in AGU uh, currently and some of the things that are planned uh, in the pathway to career advancement. But again, for AGU in the K through 12, that outreach is through partnerships. So if there are some uh, areas where, there's op where there are opportunities for partnerships, and I'll talk about one towards the end here, then that's how we would play in that area. But in the other areas, it's about mentorships, providing scholarships, providing uh, bridge programs and, and fellowships and other opportunities for folks as they advance in their careers. On the very next slide is some information on things that you might not be familiar with, but I think it's a place where you may be able to find some resources that can assist you. If you're not familiar with the AGU Ethics and Equity Center, I would advise, I would ask that you please Google that site. And I think there you will find some, uh, what we think now are some pretty good resources, but we hope that these will become more robust resources as we go forward. Just as Chris just shared with you some other resources and, and uh, places you can find information, we hope you'll be able to find uh, some additional supplementary information at the Ethics and Equity Center. So it's unique new resources for all. It's, it's categorized and segmented into resources for students, resources for uh, educators and scientists, and resources for department heads. There's nothing, there's very little there now, I think, for K through 12 educators, but that's an opportunity for us to go look at that, and with your help, we can build, build out some of these resources. Uh, this center is built on a partnership with the National Center for Professional and Research Ethics at the University of Illinois, so they have a lot of uh, leadership development resources and other resources. Uh, we do provide a lot of attention and support for harassment targets. And currently, we are conducting a lot of uh, workshops across sectors. And what that means is that we're expanding our reach beyond just the, uh, the typical Earth and Space Science academic communities through some support from some foundations. So uh, next slide. A uh, couple of other things to share with you before I close out is that we have also uh, established uh, this coalition of scientific societies to look at what are, what should be the professional ethical conduct and, and, and climate across all of STEM. So this is looking beyond Earth and Space Sciences, but looking across STEM, and I'm proud to say that the, the AGU had a hand in launching this initiative. Uh, we were a founding member here. Um, we have an executive committee, which AGU co-chairs the executive committee. Uh, but uh, since this uh, consortium was launched, in uh, February of this year, we have now have 119 societies, professional societies who have joined. Then the point being made here is that this is an opportunity to leverage when we find practices that work well within our STEM K-12 community, we can leverage in through this group, or we can leverage what's happening in other societies. Uh, although the focus here is on was uh, it was established to, to address sexual harassment, the view of the uh, of the of the committee and advisory group is we are interested in anything that promotes a positive uh, work environment because those things are closely tied together. Uh, next slide. 
The other item that is not related to K-12, but I think can have some influence, especially as we think about how we build uh, the, the pipeline for the future, uh, is the Sea Change Initiative, and this is, hit, this is spearheaded at AAAS. This is an early stage, and I share this here for you today. If you're in the uh, ESS, uh, Earth and Space Science community, just keep your eye on this, uh, because I believe this the initiative has the potential to really have an impact on diversity and inclusion across the STEM community. It's such a large initiative, though, that it's going to take quite a few years for it to really get its underpinning. It has started already. You'll see some pilots and some opportunities for those of you who are involved with uh, education in the Earth and Space Sciences to be involved with either your academic department or with your college or university. So stay tuned for that. We will have more information on the Sea Change Initiative at our uh, fall meeting, and then um, we'll follow up from there. Uh, my next slide is just an opportunity to share uh, how uh, we are extending um, partnerships and getting influence uh, across non-traditional partners for AGU. The Rockefeller Family Fund, for example, is interested in what happens uh, with, with families, so that certainly involves K-12, the National Women's Law Center, and the Urban Institute are all partners with AGU currently, so we have developed some good relationships there. But we can uh, use them as well as we talk about how do we advance some of our STEM initiatives uh, overall. And then my final slide is, uh, is on uh, an item that I feel very, very strongly about, and that's the uh, Bright Stars program. I hope you are all familiar with this. Uh, that's one of our few, uh, I think, shining stars of activities uh, within the AGU and the K-12. Uh, if you don't recognize that big guy in the picture, not the little guy, that's me. Uh, but to see a, a young student, elementary age or middle school age, at a scientific meeting, even being there is, is an eye-opener, but someone making graphs, collecting data just on a very elementary stage it's powerful. And to be able to uh, stand in front of a poster and look another scientist in the eye, even if you look up to them, uh, I, it builds confidence. And, and uh, I, I really applaud the, the parents and the mentors and the, and the teachers who go out of their way to bring their students to this conference. So I would encourage any of you who are on the call who, who work directly with, with young students to uh, check out the Bright Stars program Consider bringing your students uh, to uh, those sessions, whether they're presenting or not. It's an opportunity for exposure. The AGU meeting now is on a rotational schedule, so you will not always have to bring them all the way to San Francisco. We met in D.C. this past year. But we do have people who uh, come travel across the United States and even internationally to bring their students to participate. So just a plug here um, for Bright Stars. Uh, th this has a soft spot in my heart because I just wish I had had an opportunity to even know a scientist when I was the age of this young man. So it's a unique opportunity. I think it deserves more support than it has currently, and I would encourage you to, to try to support it. And I think that's it for my slides. Last slide, I think it says thank you. One thing I would ask is uh, what do you see as a role for AGU or scientific societies in, in the K-12 arena in terms of how, it, how to influence uh, uh, this mantra that geoscience is for everyone? Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker so that we again can hopefully have time for a little discussion at the end. Um, Erica? Sure, thank you. Um, I'm Erica Marin Spiot. I'm a professor of geography at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and also the lead principal investigator of the Advanced Geo Partnership that I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. Um, and our project is not specifically geared towards K through 12, um, but Hopefully, you know, the challenges that we're experiencing at the university level are definitely happening at K through 12 as well. So hopefully um, some of the resources we can provide would also be helpful for you. Next slide, please. 
So we've talked a lot about um, diversity in the geosciences. And if we look at the representation of women, women make up 23% of the US geoscience workforce, but only 20% at the faculty level. So underrepresented compared um, or less representation within academia. And this graph from uh, the American Geosciences Institute shows you that that 20% is an average. Some fields are doing much better. Some fields within geosciences are doing much worse. And this 20% actually represents an increase um, from the past 10 years. But that increase has been almost solely uh, reflected in the representation of white women. Next slide, please. And so if we look at broader diversity beyond gender diversity, uh, we're actually, you know, similar to, to what Billy just reflected in terms of AGU membership, we're actually seeing very little positive change. So the percentage of women of color is very, very low. Um, there's data of PhDs um, awarded to students from underrepresented ethnic and racial minorities has not increased in the last 40 years. And most geoscience departments have no faculty of color and might have one graduate student of color if they're lucky. And there's been a lot of research done on trying to understand why um, these problems in, in you know, low representation for women overall, but especially for different identities. Next slide, please. And I'm gonna talk about uh, some challenges that people have been focusing more attention on. And, and it's nice that I come after Billy because he's He's already um, introduced a lot of the work that AGU is doing in this arena. But there's a whole uh, literature of documented bias in academic STEM environments and specifically in the geosciences. And I want to focus more on hostile behaviors that create hostile climates. Um, and so bullying, I'm sure, is something that everybody in K through 12 is very aware of. And actually, if you Google resources on bullying, most of them are targeting um, the K through 12, but there's a lot of research showing that bullying does not stop once you graduate high school. And actually, you know, two thirds of higher ed employees in the United States report witnessing or experience bullying just in the last 18 months alone. And we know in academia, bullying can be a serious problem. Um, sexual harassment is another problem that we know is leading to um, people and especially women leaving the field. So more than half of uh, geoscience women in one survey had experienced sexual harassment. And there's some field uh, surveys where almost two thirds of researchers experienced sexual harassment while doing field work. And this was 70% of, of women respondents and 40% of male respondents. So we know these hostile behaviors create hostile climates that make it difficult for increasing diversity in the geosciences. Next slide, please. And we also know that identity affects experiences and vulnerabilities of different people. So it's really important when we talk about diversity uh, and Chris raised this um, in, her, in the first talk is to think about multiple identities uh, and here's where intersectionality comes into play. So we have some data of intersectionality or the effect of intersectionality, 40% um, of women of color compared to 27% of white women. Um, and this is a survey from Astrophysics, felt unsafe um, in their workplace due to their gender. 28% of women of color felt unsafe because of their race. And 18% of women of color compared to 12% of white women reported skipping professional events. So we already start seeing professional repercussions of these hostile behaviors. And a recent survey of LGBT plus physicists revealed um, you know, that different identities, even within LGBT plus community, also experience hostile behaviors in different ways. So gender nonconforming and LGBT plus scientists who identify as women are three to two times, respectively, more likely to experience exclusionary behaviors than male LGBT plus scientists and uh, transgender, you know, three times as much as cisgender um, scientists. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to address some of these hostile uh, behaviors? So I'm part of a national team funded by the uh, National Science Foundation Advance Program. Um, as you can see, we have multiple institutions involved, and then we also have uh, AGU as our main society partner, as well as the Earth Science Women's Network and the Association for Women Geoscientists. Next slide, please. And so we have a four-year grant. We're in the middle of it, um, and our main products are um, 
the development and delivery of bystander intervention and workplace climate training with scenarios that are specific to the geosciences and that incorporate intersectionality. Um, we are collecting data on workplace experiences of members of different geoscience uh, professional societies. If you're a member of AGU, that will be in your inbox very soon. We're developing teaching modules that identify harassment as research misconduct, and this is following AGU's new code of ethics that identifies harassment, bullying, as discrimination as scientific misconduct. Um, and developing a sustainable model that can be transferred to other disciplines in partnership, in partnership with professional societies. So working not just on campus, but actually trying to have uh, national impact. Next slide, please. Um, here's some data from uh, some evaluation data of some of the workshops. We've run um, you know, almost 40 workshops so far in the first two years, and we run those on campuses. We run them in professional societies. We'll go to field stations. We'll go to national meetings. Um, and we're trying to educate people on the problem of harassment. You know, can you identify harassment? What are the impacts of harassment? And what can we do to you know, to acknowledge and try to prevent these, these hostile behaviors or at least reduce their impact. So thinking about the role of professional societies, because even if people can't get support on their own, in, in their own institution, they might be able to get support from their professional uh, societies. Next slide, please. Our workshops are very interactive. Um, we do a lot of work on practicing bystander intervention skills and go through different scenarios. Uh, we do a lot of work specific to field work. Um, and so this is one example of a scenario, um, you know, and the types of questions that we would ask people uh, to discuss in small groups. Next slide, please. And in thinking about, um, you know, trying to improve diversity at all different levels in the geosciences, I want us to think about you know, do our students, you know, coming into the classroom, coming into a field experience, coming to the lab, coming into a conference, do they see themselves reflected in the discipline? Um, and, you know, one way to start thinking about this is start thinking about, you know, what is the history of our discipline and the history of our institutions? Next slide, please. And then think about, you know, um, for in improving diversity in the geosciences, we have to kind of take a more long-term approach and think about, you know, how do our current institutional structures, practices, and behaviors continue to exclude and how can we change those structures? Next slide, please. Um, part of our team recently uh, published a review of geoscience education uh, research literature uh, for the last 10 years. And we were really inspired by this um, call for a new geoscience education research agenda uh, by Lewis and Baker that came out in 2010 um, that you know, proposed or, or really implored the community to use social cultural theories for promoting positive change you know, in the classroom, in the lab, um, while doing research. And so some of the themes that emerged from our review of geoscience education was, uh, you know, promising uh, increasing challenges to science as neutral. So more people start you know, challenging whether a scientist were truly objective and what is the role of, of bias and the role of subjectivity in the work, in the work that we do. Um, we can do a better job at um, interrogating our assumptions of meritocracy in higher education and thinking about you know, how do we define uh, academic success and how do we measure that? I think that's an important conversation to have. And then a lot of the work uh, focused on improving individuals' professional development and skills, which is really important. But when we think about increasing diversity, we really have to think about bias as systemic and how do we change the structure and the culture. Um, so we'll finish off with some recommendations for thinking about the role of individuals in community social identity and how that affects people's feelings of belonging and access uh, to opportunities, thinking about the role of power dynamics. And then also one thing that I've really benefited from this project is ex you know, expanding my own education about the, the usefulness um, and value of qualitative research uh, methods. And in the next slide, I just have um, a screenshot of our website that has a great collection of community resources. Uh, you can see 
on the left uh, on the menu, the types of resources um, there for the community, and we would be open to hosting other types of information that you think would be useful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. At this point, uh, we'd like to open it up to questions and discussion. Uh, I see that we have a few in the chat, but if you want to take a moment to add something to the chat, um, in particular a question you have for any of our panelists, um, and I'll just poke around here for a minute. So, Carla, do you want us to reply verbally to some of the questions, or do you yes. want us to just reply online? No, to reply verbally. Okay. So, I see a question directed to me regarding what professional societies can do regarding diversity in the K-12 arena and uh, in respect to providing role models. Uh, and it, they related to the bright stars, uh, but, but it stated that many professionals don't feel they have the time because they don't get rewarded at work for being a role model in science. So what do we think? Uh, can we play a role in that? I, I think that's a great observation and a, and a great example of, of how professional societies can encourage that type of behavior, uh, not just doing uh, you know, Earth Science Week, but encourages members uh, to be active in their local K through 12 community through judging science fair projects or serving in, in, in uh, informal speakers at, uh, in the classrooms. There are even some uh, programs now, and I think we can help facilitate some of this, where uh, classrooms have the ability to Skype in a scientist. So you don't have to be local. An interested science teacher can arrange a Skype session with a scientist uh, who has information on a certain topic that a uh, fourth grade class or eighth grade class or whomever might be interested in. So I think there's a lot more we can do if we look aggressively at programs like that to encourage our members uh, and any scientists uh, to be involved more proactively and even to the extent of providing some type of public recognition uh, for people who do that on a regular basis. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Carl, I'm seeing a few questions on the uh, on financial barriers, also educational yep. readiness. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of students who have a disability or have some kind of a uh, an attention deficit or something very similar. Um, this is a very common one. I think a lot of our, our K-12 teachers are seeing a lot of this. Um, and I think what I would say um, when you're dealing with a family of a child who has a disability of some kind, the financial barrier is going to be very real. And uh, while there are obviously foundations and financial supports available, even at the state level, it's a lot of legwork to get that figured out um, unless you have some kind of a connection with a community or a, an organization to be able to support you through that. Um, I think that what I would really want to say here is that at any level, we should really be looking and, and I'll, and I'll kind of point to our informal educators that the, a lot of museum centers here in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Museum Center is very well situated uh, to provide informal science learning experiences across these spectrums of ability. Um, the Cincinnati Museum Center is very well suited for this um, and has had a lot of training in supporting students with disabilities. Coordinate with them. A lot of the issue with the academic readiness stems from the fact that students with disabilities are oftentimes provided with less experience to, to, to learn science. Um, for a variety of reasons, but a lot of times they're pulled out during science because it's oftentimes not one of the tested areas uh, earlier in their career. So um, understanding that your students uh, are very likely to have a limited understanding of science and a lot of it is because of the lack of opportunities and engagement. So please, please, please reach out to your informal education opportunities and your museum centers that are nearby 
Um, I, I realize there's other barriers that go along with doing that, including transportation and whatnot. But um, if you have questions or ideas, um, please send me an email, reach out, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about this. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question verbally? You can raise your hand and we can unmute you or make a comment. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no. I think I did enough wait time. Ed, was there another question that you wanted to ask? Okay, uh, next slide, please, then, Andrew. And as our speakers have indicated, they're more than happy to uh, email with you offline uh, and discuss issues further. Uh, we would like you to take a moment in the remaining nine minutes of the webinar to complete our short webinar survey. It's very valuable to us because it provides us with data to uh, continue to be able to do the webinars and to shape the direction that we go in the future. Um, I think Andrew will, okay, did put it in the chat, perfect. Uh, next slide, please. Um, also, we wanted to point you to the archived versions of all the past webinars. If you miss a webinar, you can always go back and watch it. And we have found that lots of folks do that. Oh, oh, Ed wanted to ask a question. Um, okay, hang on a moment. Uh, go ahead and do the next slide. I think we'll still have time. So our next webinar coming up is um, a showcase of my NASA data resources. It's NASA resources support instruction of NGSS Earth system phenomena. This is Elizabeth Joyner from NASA. We'll be sharing that. Um, next slide. Uh, so the National Earth Science Teachers Association, as well as the National Association of Geoscience Teachers, which I'll share in the next slide, um, we collaborate together with AGI on this webinar series. We also, each of our organizations offers additional webinars. So if you want to find out about other webinars that NESTA is offering, uh, the short URL is there. And Likewise with uh, NAGT. Um, NAGT also uh, has additional webinars beyond the webinar series that we collaborate together. Uh, and they have lots, so you should go check out their archives and go to their webinar series homepage. Again, these slides will be um, posted after the webinar. Uh, their next webinar coming up is using GPS data to teach about the Earth in an introductory undergraduate course, plate tectonics, earthquakes, water cycle, and ice mass change. That should be a very good one. Um, and then also there are other opportunities you might want to, if you're at a college department, you can ask for the NAGT traveling workshops program to come. And then um, we're also just giving you a heads up that in 2020, the Earth Educators Rendezvous will be at Stanford in Palo Alto, California. Next slide. So uh, this is our contact information and we wanna thank you for participating. But before we go, um, I am going to unmute Ed because he has a question and I think, here we go, for Erica. Thank this you. is Ed. Can you hear me, Carla? Yes. Okay. So it's really for all three speakers. I mean, we have a couple minutes left, and I was just curious, you know, just at a, a kind of a gut experiential, just face of it level, are things getting better in terms of diversity in the geosciences? 
And Eric, maybe you could comment first. Sure, I would say they're getting better for white women um, so far in terms of numbers of representation. Um, somebody asked me recently at a presentation whether you know, the problem of sexual harassment was, was getting any better. And I said, no, we just have more awareness about it and we're starting to talk about it, which is really important. Um, so maybe, maybe not the most positive end. <laughs> If I could just follow Erica on that, I, I, I agree. My comment was going to be very similar. It's getting better in that now we're actually having discussions about some issues that we, you know, five years ago, uh, we were too timid to even discuss. So I think from that standpoint, we are starting down a path of more awareness. I think the issue of, of um, uh, racial and ethnic diversity in the geosciences is still one that we are deem at a good starting point yet in terms of how we make good progress there. Uh, but I think the fact that now there are more and more people paying attention and more and more people uh, studying or, or I think we're now inviting social scientists into our space to help us with these issues, I think that's a very positive development. I would echo the, the two previous that awareness is improving, um, actual access and inclusion um, isn't moving as fast as we'd like it to be, but I would say over the past 10, 12 years, we've seen a, a dramatic increase in the awareness um, and that people are looking to make a difference in the areas of access and inclusion, which is, uh, which is nice to see. We have a lot of work to do. Thanks to all three of you for those comments. And thank you very much for agreeing to uh, present and be part of this panel. Um, once again, uh, we're all looking forward to Earth Science Week, which is next week. Um, and Ed, I think you had a couple words you wanted to say about that. Well, I just wanted to build on what Billy had said. Um, Earth Science Week is often thought of as a K-12 initiative, and it is. We, do, we provide a lot of resources uh, for K-12 educators, but it also is meant to support uh, informal science education, and we have a lot of people who are involved at the undergraduate level as well. It is also an international endeavor. We have upwards of 20 countries where events are taking place, so it, it's a way of networking with a, a pretty broad population. A lot of the materials, people think about the, the packets, the physical packet, but a lot of materials are online at earthsciweek.org, uh, which is definitely something to take a look at um, for additional resources. And I'll just mention that the National Earth Science Teachers Association will be heavily promoting uh, each focus day next week um, during Earth Science Week. So thank you all again, and please do complete the survey. That's very important again for us for our data collection. Uh, and thank you for participating. We look forward to you coming to a future webinar. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.